Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate you to the next level in your life. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. And when you get there, if you're there already, kind of hang out for a second. I just want to talk to you a little bit about tonight's message title. They're going to throw it up on the screen right now. Uh, it's called Currency. And, and, and I called it this, and as I was preparing for this message, I asked a couple people this week, as I was thinking about this word currency, I asked them, you know, when you think of the word currency, what's the very first thing that comes to your mind? doesn't have to be elaborate, doesn't have to be long-winded, just what comes to mind? And, and right, money, uh, I, I had a couple people tell me the dollar bill. I mean, we know that in our lifetime to be our currency, so we, we know when you think of currency, you think of value, you think of money, you think of the dollar bill. We know that that is, is what the United States of America uses as currency, the dollar bill. Or we know from looking on a dictionary, if, we, if some of you are looking at your phone right now and wondering what currency is, you're checking your dictionary out and seeing that it's telling you it's, it's, it's a form, of, it's a unit of, of value, it's the dollar bill, it's, it's whether it's in, in another country, a euro. But, but what always seems to amuse me and I'm sure it does most of you, even to this day, is how, how something as, as, as fragile or as, as tiny and as, as, as thin and delicate as a piece of paper can carry this huge weight of value. I mean, this, this, this piece of paper has the opportunity to be anything from a single unit, a dollar, to Five dollars to twenty dollars to a hundred dollars. Uh, there's different values, but what amuses me is that before this piece of paper was designated a value, it was deemed worthless. It was deemed nothing. In fact, it, there was no point in having it. And so, when I think about currency and I think about the dollar, I think about well, this dollar wasn't always currency. So how could something that was so short-lived? in the span of, of, of humanity, carries so much weight and so much value. Uh, b- before the dollar bill, uh, it was, there was gold, right? Gold was the currency. And in fact, uh, when they were transitioning to the dollar, the gold, uh, if someone wanted to cash in for cash value, they had to trade in the gold for a slip of paper, like a note. And that note was what they were able to use to transfer uh, the gold value to cash value. So the dollar bill wasn't always currency. At one time, it was gold. Before... Before it was gold, uh, and even today in some tribes and some cultures, it was prized possessions. It was things that people valued, that, that things that meant something to them, things that, that, that they couldn't live without. It was so vital in their life that if they were to lose this, they wouldn't live. And so people would, would trade these prized possessions for things that they wanted. They would give up whether it was tools, whether it was food, whether it was a uh, 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 fur, what, whatever, it, they would trade these things, and that was their currency. And so when I think of this word currency, I think of something of, of value, something that, that, that carried weight, something that meant something at one point of time. But if we look here at, at 1 Timothy 6, chapter 6, verse 10, here's, here's what the text tells us. It says that for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Uh, Now, I'm not, tonight's message isn't isn't focused on on the the root of of evil, on the the love of money. I'm not at all going to be getting into the the scientifics of of money and and the history of money and, and all of that. Uh, but, but a couple things I do want to make clear is, is in no way did it say that money was the root of all evil. Uh, in no way did it say that the object uh, itself was evil. Uh, and I know because I, I know I grew up in, in, um, in, in, in a household where sometimes that was misinterpreted, maybe because there was true knowledge of that scripture. And so, you know, there was times when I was told money's evil. And so I don't know if it was just a, a trick that parents used so they didn't have to give you anything, but... Uh, I know that it, it worked for some time because you look at money, you think it's evil as a kid, and they tell you that until you learn that this money can get you a lot of stuff, and then you realize, okay, well, maybe I can do with a little evil. Uh, I don't know. But, but, but the point of the scripture is not that money is the root of all evil. The, the point of the scripture is to 
recognize and to bring knowledge to the fact that it's the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. Again, I'm not here to talk about the connection between the love of money and, and evil, but I want to make a point that the act of loving money is what the Bible tells us is rooted in all kinds of evil, not just, not the object. Now, I've also heard this scripture said correctly. Uh, my grandfather, <coughs> many times, I would go to his house and typically was, it was right after he handed me a $10 bill and he would tell me, you know, the, the, the love of money is the root of all evil. And I don't know if that was his way of making sure that, you know, I only asked for 10 and nothing more so I didn't fall in love and make him seem like I was falling in love with money. But he would tell me that, and I would hear it from my grandparents, and I would hear it on TV, and, and, and you can hear it in movies, and you can hear it in TV shows, and it's referenced, and it's talked about that the, that the love of money is the root of all evil. And so looking at that scripture, now I look at that, and I'm thinking about currency, and I'm thinking, and I, I, I'm thinking, and I realize that, you know what, this scripture has a polar opposite. It has, if you want to, if you want to go ahead and flip this around and you want to focus on what God is really trying to deal with in the matter of the issue of the heart, when he's really talking about the condition of the heart, because your heart has to be in a certain condition for you to want to love something. It has to be willing to want to do that. So he's really trying to talk about the condition of the heart. And so I'm reading this and I'm looking at it. I'm like, God, you're, 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 you're dealing with heart issues now. And so I begin to realize, like, you know what, I, I believe that God is trying to address uh, some way that we would understand to live righteously. But he tells us how to do that all over the Bible. He tells us how to live righteously. He explains what it looks like. And so what I did is I, I put this together again. I, I'm now, I'm not creating my own version of the Bible by any means. I'm not creating my own translation, but I believe that if God were to summarize all of these verses that are in the Bible of righteous living and how to be righteous and the heart of the righteous, I believe that he would be telling us that the root of all righteousness is the love of the word of God. That the very thing that creates righteousness is when you and I are in love with his word, the word of God. Again, not the object, but the action of loving his word. Not the object of what the word is. We know the word to be infallible. We know the word to be true. We know the word to be eternal. We know the, world to, the word to be perfect and flawless because it's breathed by God. But it isn't the object that creates righteousness. It's the fact that you and I have made a decision to engage and fall in love with this word. That spurs up righteousness in our lives. So the root of all righteousness is the love of the word of God. Go with me to Psalms 119. Because I want to I I paint this picture or at least I want to interpret this picture that David painted of his value and his love of the word of God. And how, how it drove him to righteousness. Psalms 119, and we're going to start in verse 38. <clears throat> and it says this, establish your word to your servant who is devoted to fearing you. Turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your judgments are good. And verse 40 says, behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. I long for your precepts, your teachings, your instructions, your ways, your word, your truth. I long for that. I long for that. Revive me then in your righteousness. See, in that last verse, we see David expressing his desire. Right? When you long for something, you want it desperately. When you long for, for your next breath, if, if you were to be, if your breath was to be taken away and, and, and you needed that next breath, when you long for that breath, you want it desperately. When you're getting off of a 21-day fast, you want some meat desperately. You want something that's not veggies and nuts and processed through tofu. You don't want that. You want something that tastes good from what you know to taste good desperately. You long for it. Uh, if I were to translate this 
uh, uh, f- for my wife, it would be tacos. <laughs> she would grab this real quick and grab some tacos if she longed for it desperately. So David is saying, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. You want revival in your life, it's going to take the righteousness of God. But if you're not longing for that righteousness, good luck getting your revival. If you're not longing to see God's righteousness bring you back to life, good luck with that. What David is saying here, his, what he's telling God is he's saying, God, I know that I need to be brought back to life. How many of you know that there's some areas that need to be brought back to life in your life tonight? You, you need some revival. You need something to change. Uh, you, you, you need some freshness. You, you don't want that stagnant stuff anymore. You don't want to deal with that same thing. But if you want the revival from the righteousness of God, there has to be a longing of his word. A desire to love what he has spoken, what has been written, what has been declared, what has been promised the Bible, plain and simple, you have to long for that. See, again, it's not the object. David, David didn't bring out the scroll and said, this scroll is going to give me righteousness. This scroll will revive me in righteousness. No, he said that it was my longing, from my longing, God, from you seeing how much I desire to know you by reading your word, from you seeing how much I desire to know you by spending time with you, praying your word, bring me your righteousness. I, I brought this, um, this Bible with me tonight. Uh, this, this at one point belonged to my grandpa. It was given to him as a gift. Um, you can see the 1970s face of Jesus on here. If you can look, kind of. It was given to him as, as, a re, as a retirement gift. He was extremely old school, uh, but he loved himself some Bible. And um, the, the funny thing is, is this was given to him years and years and years ago when he was uh, retired from work. And, <clears throat> and he was probably oh, maybe a f- five, six years uh, saved or, or, or going to church. And this was given to him by some friends from his church. And... Um, you know, the funny thing is, as a kid, I was always, I was always, uh, he was, he never, he never let us leave the house without giving us some kind of envelope with some scriptures on it or a pocket Psalms and Proverbs Bible or uh, he never, he, we never left without getting something tangible uh, of the Bible, of scripture or something. Never, ever, ever. And every time I would go and we would spend the night, uh, he always ended his night at least an hour by reading in his word. He would, he would have some, uh, some classical opera, Christian choir music playing, and he'd be sitting with his Bible uh, reading and, and breaking it down and, and, and all of that, and we would go to sleep to that. Um, but not at, at any time, I never saw this Bible. I never saw it. I never, I never knew it existed. And it wasn't until about a year uh, before he died when he would start bringing up his retirement Bible as though I knew what it was. He was like, yeah, um, you know, I would go to his house and he was being transferred to a, um, <clears throat> to a nursing home and he wanted me to help him uh, clear off some of his stuff from his apartment. And he kept saying, don't forget my retirement Bible. I'm like, what the heck? He has like 50 Bibles. What do I know is your retirement Bible, the one with the most dust? I, I don't know. Like, how am I supposed to know what his retirement Bible is? And he's like, bring me my retirement Bible. It's the big Bible. You can't miss it. And, and I had no idea what he was talking about. And it wasn't until a couple months um, prior when he had a, another family member come in who was organizing some of his stuff. And, um, and then she then showed me this Bible. And she brought it out. And she said, oh, this is, this is the, everyone called him Stamps. She's like, oh, this is Stamps Bible that he was talking about. And so, uh, so I, re- I remember her telling me about it. And so he would keep asking me every, every time I called him. Did you take my retirement Bible home? I was like, no, I didn't take it. Um, Miss Washington has it. I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, she has it. She's going to hold on to it. Don't forget to get the retirement Bible. Never fail. Never fail. And I could never understand. First of all, I didn't know what I was going to do with this big white Bible. I had no idea. I, I didn't know whether to, to frame the face or I don't know what. I, 
open it up and just let it sit there. And I don't know. I, I didn't know what I was going to do. And King James Version, I don't know. I, was, I don't know what I was going to do with it, for one. Two, I couldn't understand why he wanted me so bad to have this Bible because I never saw him use it. I never saw him open it. The Bibles that he did use, I have those. I read those occasionally from time to time. Uh, I see his notes and he was actively writing in it. He would, he, he would actively put uh, thoughts of his heart in there and, and I saw him with those. And so those would have made sense if he was stressing. But he kept saying this retirement Bible, make sure you grab it. And until I, I, t- his dying breath, I never knew what, why. Why me? Why did I need to have his retirement Bible? And so, I, but, but what, I, what I learned from that scenario, and, and I, you know, I still don't know why it was me, but what I did learn from that situation wasn't that he was expecting me to appreciate the actual Bible. He wasn't expecting me to find any worth to this book. I mean, he didn't even write it in it. He didn't really use it much. He kind of just sat there from what I knew. It wasn't that he was expecting me, but what I learned from that was he, he wasn't a man who was transformed because he owned a white Bible. He wasn't a man who experienced the transformation power of God because he had a, the face of Jesus on his Bible. Because he knew of a Bible. He experienced true transformation because he learned to open his Bible and fall in love with it. And it was by falling in love with the word that drove him to care enough to make sure that his grandson had something that he changed his life and that I would get to the point or maybe he, he, he thought I wasn't fully saved. I don't know, but he would, he would care so much about what God did through falling in love with this word that he wanted to make sure it was going to someone he cared about because the root of righteousness that took place in his life didn't come from from Mr. Stamps as they knew him at his church or didn't come from uh, uh, owning 50 Bibles. It came from him learning how to take what he was reading, allow the Holy Spirit to convict and to bring change, to apply it to his life, and to watch God do things that only God can do that he had spent years trying to do on his own effort and he couldn't do, but to watch God do in one year, in two years, and to become a whole other different person. His desire to see that, drove him to fall in love with the word. And it was him falling in love with the word that brought about righteous living. See, the word of God, it was designed for you and I to love it and to live it. It was designed for you and I to love it and live it. And when you live out the word, it will complete everything it was sent to do. When you live it out, it will complete it. Uh, funny story. Now we can say it's a funny story. It wasn't a funny story a year ago. But a year ago, my wife and I had a very peculiar situation with one of our cars. In fact, it was our car. And it was a champ to the very end. It, uh, we, you probably heard stories about it. Uh, it had a window that didn't want to roll up. Uh, I, mean, I could go on and on. It was, it was very interesting. It had a lot of character. Let's just say that. We had this car for a couple years. In fact, we, we were, when, when we first got married, we didn't have a vehicle, and, and uh, we needed a vehicle, and we had been praying for one. And <clears throat> about a year uh, after we were, we were married, someone blessed us with this vehicle, and it was good to us, and we had it, and, and we used it, and it got us from place to place. But, but over some time, about, about a year when we had it, we started to realize as we were taking it to the mechanic, as we are getting it worked on, everyone would start to tell us, man, you're wasting your money putting it into this. And over time, it was like we became afraid to do anything. Oil change. Uh, I don't know. We could hold off. <laughs> oh, you got, you got a flat tire. It's still rolling. <laughs> I, I, we, we became that afraid that we didn't want to put any more money into it because everyone was like, no, if you put more money into it, you're not going to get anything back. If you put more time into it, uh, you're going to regret it. If you put more money into it, you can say goodbye to ever having enough to get another car. And some of us may treat the word of God that way, where we feel that the word of God is some kind of empty investment. And we're, we're afraid because, because we haven't quite experienced that, that, that return uh, prayer. We haven't quite experienced that dramatic 
miracle-working power, and so we're afraid to invest. But, but what I'm telling you is that Isaiah 55, 11 tells us that the word does not return void, that the word does not come back empty, that it's not some empty investment. You don't have to be afraid when you pray the word over your situation. You don't have to be afraid when you speak the word over a family member who's suffering from an illness. You don't have to worry about whether or not the word, the Bible that you speak over, over a situation, over your marriage, over your kids, over yourself is going to return results. Because the promise of God says that it will not return empty. It's not going to show up and suck up your money like our car did. It's not going to do that. The word does not return empty. Empty. <clears throat> when God speaks his word, it completes what it was sent to do. It finishes it. It doesn't leave it half done. It doesn't leave you hanging at the edge of your seat. Yes, there will be moments where what you want it to be a yes will appear to be a no. But his word is completing everything that needs to be done for your sake. In order for you to obtain a righteous life. Now I wanna I wanna take I wanna stay in Psalms 119, but I want us to go to skip down to verses uh, 140. 140, and we're gonna read uh, verses 140 to 144. And the reason why I want to stay here is because you can read chapter 119 on your own, and you can get you can get the full scope of how David. Love the word of God. But there's, there's, there's something in here that I see that, that ties in the root of righteousness to us falling in love with the word of God. And, and I do believe that this is something that David understood as he was praying this to God. And here, here's what it says in verse 140. It says, your word is very pure. Therefore, your servant loves it. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. In other words, it's the same from when it began to when it ends to when we go to heaven. Your righteousness will remain righteousness. And your law is truth. Verse 143 Trouble and anguish have overtaken me, yet it was your commandments, yet your word, yet your Bible are my delights. It was your commandments, God, that I fell in love with. Not what I plan to do. We're talking about a man who was, who was victorious and he was known for being one of the most strategic kings when it came to warfare. One of the most strategic kings when it came to planning <clears throat> and attacking and, and saving and defending. Uh, but it wasn't his commands that he fell in love with. In fact, to take it a step further, it wasn't his commands that his people or that the, 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 uh, the Israel fell in love with. It was the fact that he obeyed the commandments that came from heaven and he fell in love with them. He delighted in them so much that they were able to trust that the, same vic the victory that they received, in fact, came from God. And so that drove him to fall in love with the commandments of God. And verse 144 says that the righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting Give me understanding and I shall live. I got one more verse for you. Go in your Bibles to, to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. I have one more verse and a couple points and I'll be closing. The word of God is our currency. Whether you choose to activate it is up to you. Whether you choose to transfer what has been given to you is up to you. Whether you choose to take this currency and cash in to unlock the, 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 the open heavens, to un unlock the righteousness of God, that's up to you and I. But what God is saying is, all I desire is that you would love my commandments, and by loving my commandments, you would see my righteousness. Hebrews chapter 4, <coughs> verse 12. And, you know, when I think about this verse, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, this, this common term that you may hear 
Uh, if you've ever been in a market for buying a car or, or in general, if, if, if you've ever gone to, to downtown L.A. to get a bargain or anywhere, you, you hear this term, you hear cash is king, right? It's nothing new, right? Cash is king. Cash is king. Cash has power. Cash opens door, if, doors. If you have cash, you have the right of way. And if you're in the market for a car and, 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 and there's that one unspoken rule when you go to that dealership, no one's going to talk about it. The salesperson isn't going to talk about it. You're not going to mention it. But everyone at that table knows that cash is king. Everyone sitting there ready to make the deal knows that if you have cash, it's a different conversation than someone who doesn't. And it's the moment that you show them that you have that cash on hand, that moment that you expose it, now they know that there is a chance that that cash can be in their hands by the end of that conversation. And they know that, okay, I am going to do whatever it takes for me to walk out with that cash. And so you carry cash, you now have full power. You now have the, the ability to, to, to be operative and how, how you make your deal. You have the right of way. You, you, you can say what you want, get the car you want for the most part, get the deal that you want for the most part because you have something that they can tangibly see and take, and that's the cash. But I, I love how Hebrews 4, uh, chapter, 12 says, uh, chapter 4, verse 12 says this in the Amplified Version. <clears throat> it says, for the word of God is living and active and full of power. And I love this. It says, making it operative, energizing, and effective. The word of God is living and active, and it makes it operative, energizing, and effective. It's sharper than any two-edged sword penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit, the completeness of a person, and of both joints and marrow, the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. Church, I believe what God is telling us in this is let the word of God be your currency. Let it be, let, let you falling in love with the word of God allow you to be operative in how you need that situation to change. And how you need that bad report to become a good report. Falling in love with the word of God is what's going to teach you how to enjoy your victory, not wait for the next downfall. Falling in love with the word of God is going to teach you how to enjoy the still moments of God when you don't hear your yes because you know that he's faithful regardless. Because you have chosen to fall in love with his word. You have chosen to know what his word says about you. You have chosen to know that even when everything points as you failing, that God has called you to be more than a conqueror. Because you have fallen in love with this word, you know that even though you have been called a failure, even though you have been deemed uh, uh, useless or worthless, that the Bible, love, that God loves you so much that he knows every hair on your head and has it numbered. But that comes from loving the word of God. And loving the word of God will lead you to living a righteous life. And so I have, I have three points, and, and uh, okay, they got them, awesome. I have three points that I want to give you today, just some practical ways to learn how to love the word. Number one, you have to pray the word. Uh, and what I mean by that is, 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 is not necessarily taking the Bible and, and, and reading from Genesis to Revelation, and then that's it. What I mean is you, you take what you're reading in the Bible and, you, and pray it over your situation. Uh, if you're dealing with a, a, a situation where you're feeling like, like you're weak and, and you're feeling like you don't have the strength to, to push on and you don't have the strength to, to carry on and you're tired of, of dealing with it, uh, to pray the, the verse in the Bible that says that when you're weak, he is strong. So pray, pray the word. And by praying the word, you'll begin to learn to love it. Why? Because you'll begin to see God. You begin to see God in the flesh as you speak and watch things turn around. A second practical way to learn how to love the word is to journal as you read. You know, tonight some of you guys are, most of you hopefully are taking notes as we're going through this text. Well, I encourage you that as you get home and, and, and as, you're, as you uh, revisit some of these, these verses, have a notebook with you. Have a, have a piece of uh, paper. Have have a, I don't know, a computer with you and journal as you read. You know, I, 
I, I um, look back from time to time at a lot of my journals um, because I, I, would, I would journal a lot with paper, but I also started using them electronically. And so I like to go back to some of the first ones that I journaled. And I get to see as I was reading, I, I'm, I'm, lo- I'm watching and I'm looking back. I'm like, wow, it, it went from me reading to me writing to it being directly implanted into my heart. And I look today and I'm saying things and I'm speaking things and I'm wondering, when did I learn that? And I look back and I look at my journal and it's, it's awesome to see that that's when it happened. That on this day, I, I, God spoke to me, it lit up my life, I wrote it down, and I took it, and I re- and memorized it, and I spoke it, and I, and I repeated it, and now it's who I am. It's in my DNA, it's what I know. And so uh, journal as you read the word. Third thing is talk about the word. I have been in, I have been, uh, been in, in meetings or, or, or have had uh, lunch dates or, or, have been hanging out with friends, not feeling like being there, uh, feeling like stressed out because of whatever I was, I was having to deal with after or just checked out from even being there, hanging out at that moment. But the moment that we begin to talk about the word and we get, we get to talk about what God has been speaking to us and, and all the things that he's been doing. And then you get to hear from one person and you hear from the other person. They hear from you and then you hear yourself speak and you realize, wow, I'm not so bad. I'm not feeling that bad as I thought. I, I'm not in, in that situation, in as bad of a situation I thought I was. And so even just talking about the word, whether it's with your spouse, whether it's with a friend, uh, whatever it may be with your children, talk about it. As you begin to talk about it, see, the Bible tells us that, that faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. You want to grow in your faith. You, you want to have the faith to fall in love with this Bible that doesn't audibly speak back unless you have an app? You want to fall in love with, with, with this word that has existed for centuries and, and, and you want to fall in love with it? Talk about it. Pray it. Write about it. And, and, and more than just doing those things, do what David did. Live it. I believe that as we as we consciously make a decision to live the word of God, we send God into a celebration. We give him permission to rejoice. We give him permission to smile, to have joy, because we have decided to believe what he has said. So much that we want to see it imitate in our life. So much that we want to see something happen That when you're praying for someone who has cancer, you're not moved by the cancer because you have fallen so in love with God that you know that if God says that by his stripes he's healed, you're healed. And you're not moved by it because you're so in love with his word. And that is where people will say, that is a righteous man. That is a righteous woman. Not because you're perfect. Not because you're perfect but because you desire a perfect God, but because you long to know more of this perfect God. You long to learn about him. You long to spend time with him. The Bible tells us in John that that in the beginning was the word and that the word was with God and that the word was God. Church, as we decide to love the word of God, what you're doing is you're making that decision to love God, period. You love God with all your heart, with all your soul. And I know it, it, it may seem, uh, but it's a book, Anthony, but, but it's, it's, it's written by man and, and it's, I've heard them all. I've heard, I've heard those. I've heard that. I've heard that. But pastor says this a lot and my wife and I live by this. I, people can argue knowledge day and night. But when you have an experience from spending time with this word, there's not one word that could go against it. When you have an encounter with God through the Bible, which, which tells us in Hebrew that is living and active, that knows every intention of a man's heart, there's no arguing that. There's no challenging that. The challenge may be there, but it's useless because you know who your God is. And so, church, I want to encourage you tonight to be that person who is known to live righteously. <clears throat> Not just because... <clears throat> You're a Christian, not just because you believe in the word, but because you have fallen in love with it by deciding to live it out righteously. 
Amen. If today's message impacted you in any way and you would like to help us spread the gospel to others by giving a financial gift, please text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed as yours was today.